By way of preamble, I was here first in 69 and had a captain take care of me, as one might say. Is the PA all right? Do you hear me? No. I was here in 69 and had a captain take care of me. I was here in 1970 and had a captain take care of me. And I was here in 1971 and had a captain take care of me, all under the direction of Colonel Erdl. Now, I didn't come in 1972 because they couldn't find a captain who would take care of me. <laughs> but they got the message. This time, being the fourth in 73, I'm being taken care of by a major. How many see I've been promoted in rank? <laughs> Now, Colonel Fleur is responsible for me, and I'm going to herewith deliver what might be viewed as an ultimatum. I want to keep coming here until I get at least a man with wings or one or two stars taken care of me. So let's get about our business. Singing pipes, energized by sound, uh, uh, by air, by blowing. I have here two identical pipes on a wind chest, and we are going to blow them. They are identical, so they will be in resonance. Hold it, hold it. Now we ask, how do we change the pitch of a pipe? One way, change its length. So here I have a sliding sleeve which permits me, allows me to change the length of one. If they are now in the beginning in resonance, because there are, they are of identical length and cross-section and other properties, if I now change the length of one, I will change its pitch to lower, making the pipe longer. So we should then, if we energize the two simultaneously, encounter a beat phenomenon, which you will recognize. So you see, the greater the difference in the natural frequencies, the greater the beat frequency, as you already know. How else can these pipes, uh, what else governs the pitch of a pipe? Clearly, the density of the medium with which it is blown. So what I could do is breathe some of my hot air from my lungs into one, which would change certainly the density of the air in that pipe, but I'll skip that part. Let me change the density in one pipe by heating the pipe. <clears throat> and we should then introduce beats again. Oh, no, I'll, will somebody come up and squeeze that, hold that hose quickly, please, so we don't waste the gas in that burner, right? Thank you. Now, now we're, we're exciting both pipes. I'm going to heat one, and we hope to introduce beats again. You'll say they are in resonance. Now let me heat the other one and bring it into resonance with this one. Another interesting demonstration. Here I have a Leyden jar, sometimes called a Leyden jar, which is so arranged as to be dissectable. Here is the outer conductor, here is the inner conductor, and here is the dielectric between the two. Now you know what we can do. 
We can charge the condenser, the capacitor, the Leyden jar, store some electrical energy in it in a manner which you know. Got to be careful with this. It could knock me down. How many would like to see me knocked down? <laughs> <coughs> Colonel, we can get rid of those people right away. Hold it, hold it, hold it. I'm getting a little trouble here, but stay with it, boys, stay with it. I think the Leyden jar has some charge. We'll discover that by connecting the... <laughs> I think there is some malicious animal magnetism afoot here, but watch it, watch it. Oh, yes, enough energy there to knock down a horse. <laughs> now I'm going to do something which leads to some remarkable consequence. Watch me. I'm going to charge the condenser again. Wait a minute. <laughs> Let's have it. going to disassemble the Leyden jar. Watch me. I'm going to take it all apart, connect the outer, the innermost, the middle, all of them. I'm even going to ground them. <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to reassemble the Leyden jar. And a most remarkable thing is now witnessed. Watch it. The energy is still there. Now, you must be really surprised by that because it is an enchanting thing to witness. I'm going to do it again. And if any of these things I do again, you must know the reason for that. It's because I like it. <laughs> I'm going to do it again. Now, I... I don't quite understand what's going on here, but it must be something. Again. Funny, I'm getting a discharge from the speaker, sure. Right, right, okay. I'm going to disassemble it again, just to be sure that there is no fluke in the matter. Major, come forward, please. <laughs> Now, let us see if the energy is still there. And it is. And there's some more, of course, because of the discharge of a capacitor. And I leave that for you to think about because it is very enchanting. Now, if a student of mine were to say, yes, professor, the energy resides in the dielectric, I'd ask him, prove that this is so. So I leave it as an exercise for you to give me a proof that the energy lies in the dielectric. While we're on electrostatics, let's do something else quite enchanting. I have here a clean, clear sheet of, uh, what do you call this? Uh, uh, lucite, lucite. And I am handling it in a special way to be sure that it is, it is electrostatically neutral although I could not make it so altogether because I have handled it before and the charge resides quite uh, everlastingly in such stuff. It stays polarized a long time. But let us say it is electrostatically neutral. Here is a metal plate on an insulating handle and this is electrostatically neutral. And I put the plate on the slab of lucite 
and then I do as follows. I'm going to lift it very gently, very gently, and get a feeling for how heavy it is, how heavy. Of course, the only forces I need to overcome here in lifting it are gravitational, the weight of the plate. Now I'm going to do some work on the plate with a piece of fur, and would you believe it, I have created an enormous change in the electric property of that plate, proof. Going to bring this down upon it. I'm going to ground the upper surface of the metal plate, which has some appreciable thickness. Listen carefully. Well, we didn't get it, but I've grounded the upper surface of the metal plate. Now I'm going to try to lift it. And I feel that it sticks, as one might say. It is heavier. Clearly, there are some Coulomb forces holding these together. And I'm going to show you that the work that I do mechanically in separating these will commute to electric energy proof. Watch it. How many heard something? Yes. Uh, major? Com com major? Uh, <laughs> Uh, come here, sir. Now, what I want to show you is quite enchanting. I can continue to take energy from that system without doing any more work on it with the fur piece, as I did in the first case, and I'm going to prove that. Just lean over a little, Major, just like that, and stay right there. All <laughs> uh, right, thank you. How many see that I have charged the major? <laughs> now, to prove to you that the energy has a long life in that system, before the end of the lecture, I will try it again to see if the energy is still there. I'll do it once more here and now. Oh, it's quite sticky. Coulomb forces at close range are quite enormous. <laughs> Quiet. How many heard it? Yes. <clears throat> Consider the following. I have an aluminum plate for a lady from the UK. Where is she? Where's the lady from the UK? Where is she? Someone there? I, I should say aluminium. But anyway, it's an aluminum plate for us. And how many see, this is a good magnet, how many see that aluminum is not magnetic? No, that is wrong. <laughs> I cannot demonstrate that aluminum is magnetic, but everything is magnetic to more or less degree, and you know why. Magnetic properties have their primordial origin in electron motions, but there aren't enough electrons doing what they should do to make this magnetic. Now, for our purpose, it is not magnetic. I have mounted the plate on a central vertical shaft, and here, with a piece of clothesline, I am going to store some twist energy in this cord so that the magnet will now unwind or revolve Rotate. Now watch the plate. Watch the plate. How many see that the plate is put into rotation? And I leave it for you as an exercise, which every good author of every good book does somewhere in the text, does he not, Colonel? It is left as an exercise to the student to show why the plate rotates. <laughs> now, now a little for the ladies in the place, and you must be very quiet. Uh, who is a lady who is domestic in some sense, does some cooking and the like? Mrs. E. Scott. A long, stay right there, my dear. I have here two identical containers, one of which is filled with cream, we will imagine, and the other is filled with milk, we will imagine. Quickly now, my dear, which is the heavier? 
quick, the cream. How many agree that the cream is the heavier? Way up. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So those of you who agree that the cream is heavier, as the young lady did, I'll have to uh, account for it. You have lived only in the age of homogenization and have only seen milk homogenized, never an old-fashioned bottle of milk, which we of the older day have seen much. <laughs> Now, if I am bold in some utterances, I do it with license because of an utterance by Einstein. One can speak only so boldly with his friends. My dear, right. <clears throat> Those of you who are in physics and mechanics know that the conservation of angular momentum is an absolutely inviolate, immutable principle. The only one, indeed, in physics which has not been touched. But here I have a little toy dog which violates the principle of conservation of angular momentum. And having seen this, all physics is on the verge of collapse. <laughs> We'll take care of you fellows at the next examination. <laughs> I'm going to wind up a spring in this little dog, which means I'm storing some spring energy, and I'm going to put him down here, and he is going to rotate clockwise as I look down on him, and we must watch his tail. His tail is also roti rotating clockwise. How many see that his tail should rotate the other way for angular momentum to be conserved? And I wonder where the dilemma lies because in all truth, he does not violate angular momentum, but where does the dilemma rise? Arise. Next exercise. <laughs> You are aware, of course, that I cannot give a lecture here in physics with all the discussion and explanation and dissertation. My purpose here is only to raise some enchanting questions for inquiring minds. <laughs> the case of the three-hole can. Notice I endow it with a little Sherlock Holmesian complexion. The case of the three-hole can. Now, I want it seriously attended to. Let's hang up, boys, and be with me. Here is a can which has a hole, a hole, and a hole. And therefore, having three holes, I call it the three-hole can. How many, <laughs> how many see I'm a pretty smart fellow? Yeah. Right. Now, these holes are plugged up. And the can is filled with water to such a depth, and that depth of water is kept constant by water coming in here. And the depth of this water in can is cap H. And this hole is one quarter of the way down, and this hole two quarters of the way down, and that hole three quarters of the way down. Now I'm going to pull the plugs, keeping the head constant, and assert as follows. The velocity of efflux at this first hole, we shall call V. Now, are we not agreed that the velocity at the second hole, which is twice as deep, is 2V? How many agree with that? Way up. Way up. Now, if that is so, then the velocity here is 3V. How many agree with all those? How many don't agree? Yes, well, those who agreed, uh, we shall hang at noon <laughs> until the vultures pick the flesh away. Right. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
How many know that it is not V, 2V, and 3V? It is not, and I leave it as an exercise for you to show <laughs> what it is. But more important, what is the path of the water? Be quiet now, quiet. I suggest as follows. <clears throat> How many agree with that? Way up. Sure, the maximum range from the bottom where the pressure is the highest and the efflux velocity the highest. Less pressure, less range from the middle and least. How many don't like that? Well, let me propose another one. that? Way up. Good. How many don't like it? Well, let's try another one. <laughs> How many like that? Those people are dangerous for the human race. <laughs> How many like this one? It is wrong. How many like this one? It is wrong. How many hate me? <laughs> I'll show you what is right, which is not usually my way of life. <laughs> but having shown you what is right, then there is a mandate on you to prove it. And this is a good exercise for elementary calculus. You can do it without that. <clears throat> Greatest range from the middle orifice, less from the uppermost and less from the lowermost, but they are equal. And now a further enchanting detail, Colonel. If this is the height H or depth of the water, and this, the range R, is equal to H, which is a beautiful thing to uncover. So I leave it as an exercise for you to do that. <laughs> Boys. <clears throat> Thank you very much. For those of you in mechanics, consider the following. <clears throat> I have a circular hoop, which I put on a knife edge there and let it oscillate in its own plane. It has a certain period as a physical pendulum. Pardon me. Now, with respect to that axis, let me cut off. Is this in the way? Is this in the way? No. No, it's not. Let me cut off a piece with symmetry. How many see that the period of the pendulum must now be altered? How many agree with that? The period must now be altered. How many don't agree? I'm glad to see that show of hands. No, this is a remarkable thing which enchanted me when I first uncovered it, that the period is not changed by cutting off a hunk of it, nor is the period changed by cutting off more hunk of it. And how many see that if I cut off more hunk, the period is still T, and in the limiting case, Colonel, I get rid of the whole pendulum and I've still got a period T. How many see that my genius is getting, getting, getting hold of me? Right. Yes.
Let's see how you handle this one, boys. I have a... <laughs> Excuse me, gentlemen. <laughs> I have a coil spring of natural length L and modulus K. You know all about springs and Hooke's law. Now, I have another spring, which is exactly L over 2 of the very same stuff. And I ask, what is the modulus? How many agree that the modulus is K the same K? How many say it is different? Oh, I am sorry to see so many hands agree that it is the same K. It is not the same K. Now, having told you that much, would you suspect that it is a greater K or a lesser K? How many say greater K? 2K. 2K. Where do I hear that? <laughs> 2K I have, 2K I have once. Once I have 2K. I'm going to auction off this spring, Colonel. <laughs> I leave it as an exercise for those... Next inquiry, I have a beaker, well, more better, I guess. I have a candle and a taller candle, and they reside in a beaker, and the candles are unlighted. How many see that this is what I have on the board? No, I am sorry to say that is not what I have on the board. This is what I have on the board. How many now hate me a little more? <laughs> Over here privately, I'm going to keep track, <clears throat> plotting hate against time. <laughs> Hold it, fellas, <clears throat> so that I can get on with more. Uh, let's abate it a bit, perhaps. I'm enjoying your fun with it. Let's try this for a bit. I propose lighting both candles, as I will soon do, and then I'm going to cover the chamber. And what must we ask? We must ask, what do you predict? And you must predict that the candles First prediction, the candles must go out. Second prediction, they cannot go out simultaneously. Third proposition, which goes out first? How many say the tall candle goes out first? How many say the short candle goes out first? There's a, a vote of about two to one for the short candle. How many would like to see which candle goes out first? Yes. <laughs> Quiet, please. Quiet. <laughs> How many are glad I got burned? <laughs> Now, where lies the burden for you to give me a proper reason why the taller candle went out first? The fact that you know it went out first is inadequate absolutely because I have no interest in what you know. 
none whatsoever, <clears throat> but rather what you understand, which is vastly more important. So, what I suggest is this, that those of you who thought the short candle would go out first, and there are good reasons for that, for thinking that, should debate it with those who thought the tall candle goes out first, and convince each the other. That's a very good way to learn. Let's see where I will now go. Yes. You know that if a football is rotated by a central vertical axis, short, short axis, it comes up into this position. How many know that? Nearly everybody does. I think this will do it. So there it is. It precesses a little and gives us lots of trouble, but our first concern is that it comes up on its long axis. Now, you remember a theorem in mechanics that a system in rotation takes up rotation about an axis of its own accord for which the moment of inertia is a maximum. Now, you know that for this axis, the moment of inertia is a maximum. It's certainly less than this one here. So that appears to violate the principle. I'm going to show you the principle, which is, uh, what shall I say? Uh, which is, what, I'm trying to find some words. How many see I'm in great trouble? Don't know what I want to say and can't find the words to say it. That makes the fellow in quite a mess. Here is a disk. The moment of inertia about this axis is so much. Now, what will we discover when I rotate it? You know, all right. I need to get a little twist in that string. There it is. It has come up into rotation about an axis for which the moment of inertia is a maximum. So this appears to subscribe to the law and the football appears to violate the law. And I ask you, why is this so? A chain will do the same. A closed loop, which is very limp, and we understand when we see this why a lasso works. Watch it. Is that all right? Yeah, that's all right. Now, there, oh, there it is. There it is. Now, these subscribe to the law, but the football appears not to. And I leave it again for, for you as an exercise to discover why things, to quote Kepler, his ambition to discover why things are as they are and not otherwise. Now, some more, which demonstrates the beauty and drama of physics. Here is a metal plate. Here is a little violin bow. How many see that I am a little fiddler and that's why I have a little bow? <coughs> so I'm going to bow the plate. We know the plate is vibrating because we hear a sound. But how it is, is it vibrating? We can't see because its amplitude is too small and the uh, vibration uh, pattern is too complicated. Now I'm going to sprinkle it with some sand. I sometimes use sugar, which sweetens the music. <laughs> Now, watch the behavior of the plate when bowed. Is it covered all right? Yes, that's very good. Is that the camera covering me? Now, let me bow it another way. Now let me bow it another way. Did I have that before? 
No, I don't think so. Now let me bow it another way. No. And are you not agreed that physics can be a beautiful and dramatic thing to contemplate? So I am led to tell you that Schladny, who first explored this business, showed this to Napoleon. And what did Napoleon say? Professor Schladny makes musical sounds visible. Very pretty thing. How many have studied Bessel functions? Any? You know you need Bessel functions for this uh, exploration. Those of us who have never grown up, you have seen this before, I'm sure, but I like it, and so I'm going to show it. And if you don't want to see it, you just close your eyes in prayer, and I'm going to do it, Colonel, for thee and me. A little toy car, I wind a spring, store some energy in the spring, release the spring, turns a fan, and some air blows out of this chimney. Little turbulence here, probably resulting from the hot air I have been blowing. <laughs> there are more people I hate. <laughs> oh, yes. Is there air conditioning coming there? Let me try it here. Now, if I turn the stream of air off the vertical, does not reason suggest that the ball will fall down? No. Oh, now a very important point in your learning. Your answer to it was wrong. Reason does suggest. <laughs> It is only when you have improved in your competence to reason in the matter that you can now say it will not fall down. So you must learn how to learn, if I may be so bold to say. Watch it. But that isn't all the pleasure we can have with a little toy car. <laughs> we can have more. see that I have not yet grown up. <laughs> How many of you have at one time or another seen the board and the paper? How many have not seen it? Well, then it deserves being seen, so I'm going to show it to you. <clears throat> now, for those of you who have seen it, I would hope that you are not of the view that having seen it once, you've seen it enough. Because, Colonel Ertl, I have been doing it for 40 years and I'm always enchanted by the results of it. I have a sheet of paper for convenience, say it is 20 inches by 30. That's uh, 600 square inches. I put it here in the horizontal plane and flatten it out. <clears throat> On each square inch, roughly, there are 15 pounds of load. 600 square inches, 15 pounds per square inch, 9,000 pounds of air on there, which does not want to be accelerated rapidly. Newton said that, among others. 
Now I can accelerate that air from here to the ends of the atmosphere at a slow rate. Sure. But now let me try to accelerate it rapidly by delivering a short, smart blow here to the paper, to the board. Reason suggests, again I say, reason suggests the whole thing should catapult. But further consideration of it dictates against that. Watch it. How many see, how many see the paper did not move? Yes. Are you not agreed that the push of the air is quite substantial? Now I'm going to do it again, Colonel Erdl, and you know why? Because I like it. <laughs> How many would like to see it again? Yeah. Oh man, we've got it made. Oh, a little lateral force. And, but I'm led to say, how many want to mess around with me? <laughs> I'm getting a little warm up here. Before I divest myself of this thing here, I want to show you that I have a Hooke's Law tie. <laughs> Let's look into Mr. Doppler. Consider the following. You are going along the road, the highway, at what you think is a reasonable pace in your car, and you hear a siren. Let us follow what the brain does. Siren. You first explore quickly. Is it ambulance? Is it fire? Is it police? Let's say for our convenience it is police. <laughs> the next decision is this. Is it coming upon me from the front, from the right, from the left, or from behind? I decide it is coming from behind. <laughs> How many see that my foot is automatically lifted from the accelerator? <laughs> now it is blowing its siren, and you know as it advances upon you, there is a rise in pitch. As it gets abreast of you, the pitch is its own natural pitch, which is what you hear. And as it recedes from you, there is a decay in pitch. I'm led to say that if there is an instantaneous decay to zero, you've had it. <laughs> so here is Doppler. <clears throat> you are hearing 512 vibrations per second on the drum of the ear. Now, That sounded higher than that. Yes, it's an octave highest, 1024. <clears throat> How many see my hearing is impaired with age? <laughs> How many get it? Yes, yes, Doppler. <clears throat> Wonderful little adventure. Let's go to Bernoulli. Bernoulli. First, how many see that I have an empty tin can? Empty. Never, jamais, never. Air in the can. How many said the can was empty? Oh, it might be if I had it on the moon, but not on the earth. I have here a tea tube with some special construction internally. I'm going to put this tight fitting into the can. I'm going to blow a sharp stream of air across the top of the can through the tube. A reduction in pressure is felt by the can. And now what will the atmosphere do? Well. We hope it will do what it should do. <clears throat> Let me have much air. More air. How many see the push of the air? Push of the air. Now, 
<clears throat> since we're in an energy crisis and should be conservative and not pollute things, and since cans are expensive and I don't want to put the academy to any further expense, I'm going to recover the can. How many see I'm a noble citizen? Right. <laughs> How many see I can use the can next time I come? <laughs> right. Right. Now, something more enchanting. I have here a funnel. Would you be good enough to hold that moment? I have here a glass funnel. And I'm going to put some puffed rice in the funnel. And I'm going to blow some air up into the funnel to prove to you that air is coming out of the funnel. Because you might not believe it otherwise. How many sea air is coming out of the funnel? <laughs> no doubt about that. Ping pong ball. Going to put the ping pong ball in the funnel. How many see that if I blow some air up through the funnel, the ball will be blown out. How many see that? Never, no, but reason suggests it should be blown out. More air, much more. Let's blow this out. How many see that the harder I try to blow it out, the more it sticks? And if I quit blowing it out, it'll fall out. Proof. Whoop. <laughs> How many are glad to see me suffer? <laughs> How many see you quit blowing it out, and then it falls out? on it. While we're on Bernoulli and we've got the man at the air, <laughs> whoop, oh, a little too much air, I think, just a hip. <laughs> but that is not nearly so dramatic as this. Here is a golf ball. Give me lots of air. That's enough, I guess. Golf ball. Watch it. was a little unsteady in the hand and maybe a fluctuation in the airflow. Can I get that ball in a horizontal plane with the airstream? <clears throat> I leave that for you to consider. And now a little more on Bernoulli. <clears throat> but I think Colonel, where's Colonel Edel? I think I should tell them the story of the lady who had a chimney that smoked, don't you think? The story is as follows. The story is as follows. <clears throat> a neighbor had a house here, <clears throat> and up here, my house. <clears throat> How many see I'm a little higher status there? <clears throat> One day I was working in my study back here, Front door, knob, windows in the house, of course. One day I'm working back there and I hear a knock on the door. I go to the front door and it's the lady from this house. Lady from this house. So I'm standing in the door. She said, Professor, do you have a fireplace? I said, I do. And she looked past me at the fireplace. And she said, Professor, does your fireplace smoke? 
And I said, it does not. She said, why does it not smoke? And I said, because it resides in the house of a physicist. Whereupon she said, that may be so, but your doorbell does not work. <laughs> Whereupon I said, I have my doorbell not working, so as not to be bothered by people like you. <laughs> well, anyway, her fireplace smoked, and she wanted to know why, so I went down here on the street, and here we are, side by side. And I'm telling her that the air velocity here is less than here, and Bernoulli is better to me than he is to her, and that if she had some more stuff put on here, it wouldn't smoke, which she did, and it didn't. Now there's another tale to this. I happened to tell this story on a Steve Allen show, and some subsequent to that, a lady saw Mrs. Miller, said she had seen me relate this, heard me on the Steve Allen show, and wanted to know <coughs> Uh, if I had fixed my doorbell. No, said Alice, we sold the house. <laughs> and the woman thought we sold the house because the doorbell didn't work and I couldn't fix it. So I'm going to show you Bernoulli. <clears throat> Here's my chimney. Fireplace, chimney. Going to blow a sharp stream of air across the chimney. How many see I have a good draft in the chimney? How many see I've got a good draft in the chimney? Right, clean up the place. Right. How's our time, Colonel Floor? Where is the Colonel? <clears throat> How many know the business of the straw and the potato? How many have never seen it? Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Raw potato, straw. Want to drive the straw through the potato. Watch it. Well, it didn't quite make it. A little more, I'll try it again. Well, didn't quite make it. How many see I don't know how to do it either? <laughs> Are you laughing at me or with me, boys? <laughs> How many see I did it? Give me a small hand. <clears throat> now, Major, come up, Major. <clears throat> I'm going to give the Major his own potato and his own straw. Drive the straw through the potato. Beautiful, pretty near. Turn the straw around, use the other end. Now watch it, don't use the same hole, huh? <laughs> poor straw. Poor straw, he says. Well, point of view, that straw may be fouled up there. But now, let's discuss it, uh, Major. Let's just, uh, watch it. <clears throat> One can either pinch the straw tightly at some place, trap some air, gives more rigidity to compression along that member, or one can close it here, trap all the air, and do whoop, 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 and do so. Right. Now, hold on. Hold on. I'm going to give the Major a straw for his own little use. <laughs> Watch it now. <laughs> oh, you discovered it. How many see I did? <laughs> what a friend. What a friend. Coefficient of expansion, alpha. I have some stuff that has a positive alpha, which means it expands when the temperature goes up. We'll consider this a perfectly circular ring with a diameter of its own stuff. Now I put it in the oven of my stove to heat it. 
How many see that I have put it in the oven of my stove? Now, if you have not, you have no imagination, and I don't like you. So you will imagine that I have put it in the oven of my stove. How many can imagine that? Now then, it heats up. Question, does it retain its circularity or does it whop? How many say it retains its circularity? How many say it whops? Those of you who said it whops are wrong, and so I leave it to you to discover why it does not deform. With a few minutes left, a little bit on the enchantment of singing pipes. <clears throat> I have here two pipes <clears throat> which are identical in all respects save their lengths. And in each I have put a little wire screen the like of which you have in your windows for mosquitoes. And I'm going to heat the screens. And a remarkable, enchanting thing emerges. Watch it. Longer pipe in my left hand. Heating the screen. Storing some thermal energy. And notice the long life, acoustic life of the pipe. Now I'm going to do it again. The music can't fall out like that. You know that, Colonel. <laughs> now the music can fall out. Now I'm going to fill the pipe again with music. Quiet. Can't fall out but I'm going to push it out. <laughs> How many see I'm having fun? <laughs> All right. Now let's do the shorter pipe, which will have a higher pitch. Can't fall out. Now I'm going to excite them simultaneously. Since they have different natural frequencies, you know the consequence to be expected. Beats. Beats. Now, can we do this with other pipes? Sure, I have an array of them. Pipe. Quiet, quiet please, quiet. Filling it with the music. Before Colonel Floor says what he wishes to say, I'm led irresistibly to say a word or two more for myself. As a man gets older, and you will in due course find it so, he is led to consider, to contemplate how has his life been and what events have been best for his spirit. Of those in my own life, my time with Einstein, my time with Walt Disney, and these here at the Academy must rank as the highest. Thank you, Colonel.